past the hour and we are ready to get started. Hello everyone, I'm Sophie Johannan, clinical scientist at Galvanized Therapeutics and the host for this month's LinkedIn audio discussion. As we get started, a few LinkedIn audio helpful hints. Please take this time to use the invite button at the bottom of your screen to invite your friends and colleagues to this event. If you have a lot of followers and want to narrow the search, you can use words like clinical trials or research. Taya Romero will be archiving today's conversation and we will include the link in our summary post on LinkedIn as well as in our clinical trials one burning question OBQ LinkedIn group. Feel free to tap on profiles, follow me, our other moderators and panelists here today and be sure to check out and follow others in the room where inspired. You will also see the emoji button at the bottom of your screen. You can use that to respond if you want to join but are not prepared to speak. So I want to welcome all of you to our Clinical Trials OBQ, One Burning Question, LinkedIn audio event today. My, mod my co-moderators and I have designed Clinical Trials OBQ for clinical trialists, pharma, and biotech industry professionals, and patients and patient advocates interested in solving burning questions in clinical trials. We hold these sessions monthly, and the next one is currently scheduled for Friday, June 22nd. Now I'm going to turn the mic over to my co-moderator, Michael Young, to introduce himself, our sponsor, and today's topic. Take it away, Michael. Hey, thanks, Sophie. Uh, welcome to everybody, and uh, based on what we can see on screen here, this is a great gathering of uh, participants here, and um, we will look forward to hopefully getting to some of your comments and questions here shortly. Um, I'm Michael Young, and I'm a life science C-suite consultant. I work at the intersection of clinical strategy and commercialization. Um, I also support today's sponsor, Consuli.net, as a fractional CMO. And for those of you who don't know our sponsor, um, Consuli, um, broadly, Consuli is a public benefit company. It's a B Corp with a mission to enable in individuals to participate in the data economy. Experts suggest that our individual health data is worth about $20,000 per year. So what Consuli does is helps people choose who gets access to and how the, their personal information is used. And if desired, um, they get uh, paid for their data and can make medicine better through this process. Consuli does this by operating a marketplace for members where Consuli becomes their agent for their data management and for their enrollment. Uh, members receive smart matched individual offers from, uh, from Consuli for various types of data opportunities, clinical trial opportunities, um, and other data trials. There's no cost to, uh, to join the Consuli movement, and you can learn more by um, checking out Consuli, that's C O N S U L I dot net, N E T. So, um, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on uh, further introductions and we'll try and get into the meat of the matter now and uh, check out our clinical trials, One Burning Question. And Christine uh, von Reisfeld is going to lead us in this discussion today. So, Christine, I'm going to turn it over to you and have at it. Thank you, Michael. You know, I always like to have at it when uh, we get to these topics. <laughs> And it is Mental Health Awareness Month. I know a lot of you know my story, and you've probably been following around with all of my updates on pharmacogenomics and what's happening here in California with AB 425. But as I've discovered my own uh, information around pharmacogenomics and how it affects me and, and really how it affects everyone, um, the topic has really become a fascination of mine, and especially when we're looking at mental health disorders. So mental health disorders are often poorly understood at the molecular level, making it difficult to develop targeted and effective treatments. Though medication is the standard of care for most of the psychiatric conditions, many of the drugs used to treat mental illness have significant adverse effects and reactions. And I'm sure you all have seen and heard that a lot of mental health medications actually have a side effect of suicidal thoughts and suicidal tendency. The pharmacogenomics has the potential to improve the design and execution of mental health clinical trials, leading to a more effective treatment and better outcomes for individuals with mental health conditions. 
today I have, well, I was supposed to have three, but I, oh, and Paul Simmons, Bob Paul Simmons, I do see you on our stage, thank God I was going to say I have three speakers, we, we didn't hear from Paul earlier, but really that are going to share their experience. I've brought in people from different silos to kind of explain how pharmacogenomics looks in their area and how it can really impact all of us. And so I am uh, going to start the conversation here. And today's discussion, our one burning question is, are we crazy not to include pharmacogenomics and precision medicine tools in mental health trials? And what are the pros and cons of using this? So I'm going to let my guests introduce themselves before we get started on the conversation. And at the top of my screen right next to me is Benaz. So Benaz followed by Reem. And then Paul, if you'll introduce yourselves, that would be perfect. Although I don't see Reem anymore, and I hope it's just my screen. But Benaz, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Christine. Uh, I appreciate uh, coming here and everyone who's attending. So I'm a pharmacogenomics medical science liaison. I really came across genetics, the whole world of genetics, when I was doing research with a university and going into older adults' homes, and they're all on a ton of medication, and their reaction, whether it was benefit or side effect, was vastly different. And so when I came uh, across what's happening it was in the genetic space, I realized that is the missing piece of why everyone's um, reaction or outcome is um, very vastly different. So I set out wanting to change the whole world and, you know, kind of educate everyone on understanding that before and after or during um, making decisions for their patients. And so that's, that's how I got here to begin with. Perfect. And I want to say, too, if you are not aware of pharmacogenomics and you don't have that, that knowledge of it, please check out. Banaz has a podcast where it's – Banaz, can you – Yeah, film it's it pretty big. It's, it's NGX for Pharmacist Podcast. I know it says the board pharmacist there, but there's a ton of other individuals from all the uh, uh, lives are listening and we gear it not necessarily towards pharmacists, it's just worded that way, but a lot of different views. We, we have lovely, amazing Christine on there as well. You know, patients come in there, share their stories. Um, you know, we have, um, you know, in different speakers that speak, speak from their experience or, you know, uh, things like that. So it's just anything and everything around the topic of PGS is what we talk about on there. And for a basic explanation, pharmacogenomics, if you think about pharma and the drugs and genomics together, it's pharmacogenomics. And it's basically how your body breaks down or metabolizes compounds, which then can actually help your physicians tailor drugs more to yourselves. And in the clinical trial space, this could actually be helpful in getting drugs through FDA approval if you were able to tailor some of these meds to people who might have side effects only because they slowly metabolize or quickly metabolize something. And Reem, are you still here on my audience, on my panel somewhere? I am. Ah, oh, thank you. You want to introduce yourself and tell us yeah. your thoughts? Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Reem Yunus. And uh, I'm a VP of uh, Digital Transformation Strategy at Medical. But I have to say that close that uh, all opinions and thoughts in what I share today is are my own and not a reflection of medical uh, stance. So just off the bat here, a little bit uh, about me. I, um, I have a PhD in genetics uh, and uh, worked actually on looking for genes that control um, immune response for uh, to infectious diseases. So it by nature was a very multidisciplinary um, approach. And, uh, and that's been uh, sort of the hallmark of my research uh, and my career being placed in more of a multidisciplinary. I'm currently at Medical as a technology company I work and still wearing uh, multiple hats where I bring uh, a sort of a work at the intersection of science, data, and, and uh, technology. And the aim is to modernize our clinical trial approaches. We cannot continue to uh, basically uh, um, use um, methods and approaches uh, of the 
the 1940s. It's the first uh, randomized clinical trial approach was uh, uh, established then. And that was based on, on you know, um, science and, and data science and statistical methodology that was, was uh, current for that time, date. And with the advancements of science, advancements of the data science, we ought to uh, be, um, and of course technology, as you all know, uh, we ought to be uh, looking at methods of uh, conducting um, clinical trials that would benefit and be appropriate for everybody to participate. So that's uh, where I am, and uh, and that ties to, the, of course, to the conversation. So we now, you know, we, we participate in, in, in clinical trials. Many studies uh, run pharmacogenomics to understand uh, how uh, you know participants would would react to that uh, to that say novel drug, and it is important to uh, I see it as very important to uh, share that knowledge with the participants because it's not only will be contained to the 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 trial of the participation in that uh, setup, but it could um, impact other uh, health aspects for that participant. So I, while I do support the sharing of data uh, and pharmacogenomics, especially, we have to be so cautious about how how much of that data and when and how to to share it with the participants. Uh, there are cons and there are pros to that. So I'll, I'll stop here and we'll. Uh, take Thanks, Lynn, and I. And our third guest, Paul, can you just say hi really quick so I make sure your mic is working and that I can hear you? Paul, I see you. Oh, I've never used the LinkedIn before. I think it's working. <laughs> Good morning. No worries. I'm, I'm just glad that you're here. Good morning. And Paul Simmons is uh, with DBSA, California Depression Bipolar Support Alliance. I'm also um, one of their committee members. So one of the reasons why I wanted to bring Paul in is because not only does he represent a mental health community, he also focuses specifically at DBSA here in California on legislation, which I think is one of the key points that we're all missing when we talk about these things is we can talk about it all we want, but unless there's legislation behind it, um, you know, some of these things won't happen. So Paul, will you introduce yourself really quick and then kind of um, and then we can start our conversation. Sure, I'm probably the, the Johnny come lately to this to this game. Uh, I've been with DBSA for about seven years uh, as executive director for a couple years. And um, yes, I I've been working on those bills, uh, AB four twenty five this year, and other bills uh, relating to pharmacogenomics. And uh, yeah, I just I just really. Uh, but when I talked with Christine about it, we went to the Capitol and spoke with the folks there. And it's uh, it's just a really important thing. Uh, of course, 425 is relating primarily to Medica Medi-Cal, Medicare, et cetera, uh, reimbursements for it or making it a standard benefit, which I think is really, really awesome. Uh, I do have those experience as well. And uh, that's what DBSA is all about. We are um, everyone involved with it pretty much has the experience of some mood disorder or mental health issue. Uh, Christine, is that what you wanted? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I wanted, Paul. And really, I think it's important to have you here because you do represent a peer support run group. And, and Paul, DBSA has some amazing support groups. You've organized legislation. We're trying to get some other things uh, uh, into play. But I think that's a big part of these things. And as we talk about clinical trials, I see we have a huge audience here of a lot of people in clinical trials. And mental health is, is a little bit different. And so really, mental health drugs are some of the most significant and the adverse effects. I had some statistics, but my internet is not working that great, so I couldn't get them up for you. But I will post them in the comments later of articles that you guys can look at and look through in relation to some of the medications and adverse effects. And Benaz, I know you had some comments as Reen was speaking, and I'd like to just go to you and then kind of 
pull all of us in for the conversation. I know that um, we each have different key points um, that we can kind of piggyback on. But Banaz, go ahead and start that for us. And then as soon as our conversation is done, we're going to welcome you guys up for any comments or questions as well, but really want to cover some of these things first. So Banaz, go for it. Yeah, thank you. And as a, before I start, as a, a disclaimer, I got to say anything I say is strictly my views and opinion and none of others. But I really want to start off defining the term precision medicine since I think it's been used uh, sometimes interchangeably with pharmacogenomics, that term. So they're really not the same. Precision medicine is a bigger umbrella where pharmacogenomics falls under. And so every time a patient sees a doctor, their doctor is really using the concept of precision medicine, whether they do know it or not. So the example I always like to use is, let's, let's say a patient comes in complaining of extreme lethargy or tiredness, right? And to the point where they really can't, they're non-functional, they can't get to work or anything like that. So what the provider would do is take a health history, maybe list the medications they're on, or some diagnostic test, let's say viral level check, complete blood count, whatever that is to come up with some kind of um, diagnosis. So after they do that, they have a diagnosis, now they need to uh, you know, select a medication for that specific patient. You know, they got to look at the kidney function of that patient. You know, maybe they're a bus driver, so would that make a difference on what medication that may be less drowsy to pick, right? So, and their age and all of that factor, now they come up with a medication. So that whole uh, process is really called precision medicine. If you break down the word, is personalizing patients' medications based on their individuality. So where, we're, where we stop is really when we give the patient that medication. When the patient goes home is what... I want to call simplistically pharmacogenomics, where now we're looking into how's the patient reacting to that medication? What is the body doing to that medication? Those are all the pharmacokinetics and dynamics, right? How's it being breaking down? Um, you know, it, how's the, you know, the metabolism for that patient? And so is it more efficacious? Is it less efficacious? Is it causing more side effects? So all of that really falls under pharmacogenomics and that we're comes into play. So understanding how genetics can play a part in response to medication is key because that's where the outcome we want is. So really, again, you know, that's a com more comprehensive view. So we got to understand uh, that's key in making more comprehensive clinical decision. But of course, there's other factors that are involved. You got to look at drug, drug interaction, you know, concepts of phenol conversion, which is really the blind spot of PGX and lifestyle factor if someone's smoking with that but the genetics piece is really important understanding that so i just want to kind of point that out so we get a good um background on those two terms i love that you put that definition in place because i do find that a lot of us don't understand that and i think one of the things that we have to think about too is when we, when we think about that concept of precision medicine is that we do need more information and more data to get to that precision point. And so really that idea of, of you know, getting more people involved in clinical trials to build this information up to be able to get those answers. Um, and Reem, can I, can I go to you with your, your thoughts? Because we, we have the ability to run these kinds of things, and I know that there are a few companies out there who are implementing pharmacogenomics in their clinical trials. Can you talk to us a little bit about your thoughts and, and your thoughts too on if on how giving back this information, specifically pharmacogenomics, could maybe help people? And just your thoughts. Yeah, of course. Uh, well, I think Banaz uh, has summed it up beautifully. Uh, you know, with the precision medicine and how pharmacogenomics played uh, in that. You do, we have to understand, and then that ties to returning data to the patient. As I said, like, you know, it is important to return some data, but you have to also put it in a context. Uh, it could be, okay, you get your uh, uh, um, genome uh, sequence uh, results back, and you probably could take it to your clinician and they might look at it and not get <laughs> any, it might, might not make any sense of it or don't have the, the tools to, to really understand the data. So that's one. You as a person, probably I think uh, this 
when I was looking at some literature and uh, health literacy uh, in the U.S. It's more than 50% of people have um, and somewhere between infant, low or even uh, below basic to intermediate uh, health literacy. So how do you take that massive data and make sense of it? That's one aspect of it. And then with the NASA guest, you know, like that, looking at it as a holistic, as a whole body, as also um, a, a person that lives in certain circumstances, certain uh, conditions, which we know that could impact, uh, you know, the methylation of DNA, which is like, you know, the epigenetics. Uh, our genes do not work in, in uh, um, vacuum as just single single pathway we can interact with other pathways within the within the cells uh, so uh, that the disease itself has a different physiology so all of that could come to play when looking at the data and so when we want to share data which is very important we cannot undermine that but we have to be cautious about how how to uh, return it back to the to the patient or to the participant and what they are gonna do with, with that because you don't want to um, create a panic not necessarily. It's like, oh, my, my, you know, my results are showing this and I might be prone to, to that disease. Well, it might not because you have a different background, genetic background, but your, that gene or that pathway is working under those uh, sort of genetic um, uh, background condition. So these are the things that we probably don't, not probably I feel strongly about taking in consideration when we are uh, looking about you know taking a returning data to patients. I'm a proponent of sharing data uh, with not just like you know uh, looking at it from in the clinical trial space, looking at it from uh, uh, the research to the patient, but also between between um, say. Even sponsors that have um, um, are working on similar uh, developing some similar drugs, and we can benefit from from sharing data as well as sharing it with, uh, say, third parties. Uh, where I sit in a technology company, uh, we could, in a way, like technology with with uh, big engine of analytics, data analytics, could actually tease a lot of information. So. Again, um, while it is, these things are, are very important, we have to be also cautious about how we use it. Um, so these are sort of my thoughts on that. I love those can I, thoughts. Can I add a follow-up, Christine, to uh, what Dream was saying? Yeah, please. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, please. Yeah, so I think she, she's right on point. Uh, it, it is really important to have PGX testing done in clinical trials, but it's also we have to be mindful of how that um, interpretation is kind of given back to whether providers or patients. So to kind of go give more color and context is like, you know, just because, and I get this a lot, just because we are, um, let's say a patient is a status of a poor metabolizer of a specific gene, right? It doesn't always necessarily equate to a dose reduction, right? We got to think outside of the box and consider other factors. For example, is the DERP have a large therapeutic index, meaning that if you change the dose for a small amount, it's not going to have a huge impact versus a medication that has a narrow therapeutic index, which is warfarin, right? You, you know, small amount of changes in the dose, you can have a huge impact. So what if a drug goes through multiple pathways, and so it, it can compensate for one pathway that may not work efficiently? So, and also, you know, um, it is, again, is the patient smoking with that medication? What does that look like? So let's say now we figured out the patient is a poor metabolizer for a specific uh, gene and they're processing this drug, serum concentration level high. Okay, great. Let's, let's say, I'm just making this very simplistic, right? We can cut the dose. So how much do we cut the dose where we're still at an efficacious level, efficacy level, but not side effects, causing side effect, right? So when we do decrease it, what does that look like? So, so all these um, information and outcomes have to be evaluated before there's, you know, guidelines provided and you know actionable reports for either patients or clinicians. So just, it, it takes a lot of time. CPIC does a really nice job coming out with guidelines, but these are all the factors to think about, not just focusing on 
a metabolism issue or one aspect. Again, if you are, a, a, let's say, a poor metabolizer, there's a, a lot of other factors to consider. Um, so anyway, I just wanted to make sure that uh, I bring that up. Wow. Thank you, Benaz. That was on point. I'm so glad you brought that to our attention because for some of us who are not very well involved in pharmacogenomics as you are, it's important for us to understand it's a multifactorial issue and really all of the facets should be brought to the physician or physicians or caretakers of that patient before a decision is made. I think that's, that's really a key point. Thank you so much. And I want to bring Paul back for a second because I want to talk about that patient side of it and how do we educate people more on these things. And it is going to be through these patient groups. But I also wanted to touch on, I had a, an issue just the other day with a PGX, and I'm not sure if any of you guys heard it, but I was, in the, I was hospitalized. I asked specifically for Dilaudid by IV because I know that's one of the only medications that works. And um, if you know medications, you know that most people don't ask for that. And when you do ask for that, sometimes there's a thought that somebody is more of a drug seeker than someone in pain. And so I had to have a discussion with my physician around pharmacogenomics and results because he wasn't aware of it. And so I'm finding that as we educate and empower patients, we're also leaving the physicians out of this conversation, and it's sometimes causing like a a power struggle. And so I think that education part of it is key. And Paul, you run a group and you're working with patients who are running these support groups and everything else. What are what are your thoughts on on these things? If if a company were to come to you, Paul, and tell you that they're interested in running mental health clinical trials, you know, and they're they're wondering if you have patients that that would help them. Would you be interested in helping people if there were more like tangible results back to a patient like a pharmacogenomics test or even just having that guarantee when you're working with the types of drugs and how they influence the brain? Long question, hopefully a shorter answer. Um, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Um, well, I think I think right now we're we're kind of in a place of people are not particularly aware that pharmacogenomics even exists, uh, particularly in our area where we are often dealing with people who are sometimes not even in clinical a clinical setting. Sometimes uh, if they have a mood disorder, if they have a mental health issue, uh, they might be self-diagnosed. So we get a really wide range of people. Um, <clears throat> Second, we've got yeah, we got to say PGX because uh, even the legislators that have been talking about the bills can't pronounce it. Um, but but I think that lends itself a little bit to people having an understanding of, of, of what it is. Uh, we have dipped our toe into the water of working with a, a group that uh, recruits people for for uh, clinical trials, and we're trying to get them in that space. But of course, that's going to be trial by trial in terms of integrating. Um, the pharmacogenomics. Um, so yes, we're really we're really interested in in letting people know about it. We talk a lot about in our support groups about people who have difficulty with getting the right drugs, and we talk about it a little bit. And people kind of glaze over when I start, you know, using the pharmacogenomics word and uh, the P word, as I call it, and. Um, so yeah, I think I think it's a lot about education, so that people are even interested in it. And I think if they do ask their doctor about it, or if they do ask their psychiatrist about it, I think there's going to be more usage of it. In terms of the clinical trials, um, I mean, I think it's I think it's awesome. But as I've been listening a little bit, um, I wonder. I I know that with clinical trials, very often. Um, the selection of the people getting into the trials can be challenging in order to make it not only a, um, not sure what the word is, but, but, but a good representation of the, of the people that, 
that you want to serve rather than just um, selecting people that maybe for your trial will give you the results that you want. And I know that um, I know that can be that can be kind of a double-edged sword because you do want to get the people that are most likely to to perhaps uh, benefit from it, but at the same time, if you don't get a broader you, sometimes you can miss the bigger picture, and uh, that would be my only concern with with using pharmacogenomics in, in screening, certainly for these um, for these clinical trials. Uh, but uh, still, I think it's uh, uh, I think it is important that we are involved there. So uh, the effectiveness of the selection of the people is, is the thing I'm really thinking about a lot. What effects pharmacogenomics would have. Yeah, and it's we're an still in that right now for us. Right? <laughs> oh yeah, we're and we're still learning, right? And so I think it's something that as we go forward, we're learning together. And I know that uh, we're at that 9:30 halfway mark. I would love to open it up to our OBQ, OBQ crew and anyone that might have some questions for our audience, and really to just kind of further this conversation because I know. PGX isn't something that we often talk about, but um, it should be. So uh, I know Scott. Scott, did you want to go first? Sure, Christine. Um, thanks so much, and thanks for um, our guests for uh, joining today and kind of laying the foundation on a super fascinating topic. Um, my background is pretty much purely on the clinical development side, so thinking about better design of clinical trials that are um, – more appropriate for patients and patient friendly and suited to patients. And so my sort of angle in, in thinking about the P word, as we call it, I love that, um, is of course thinking about good science and thinking about that um, we're designing studies that are appropriate for patients and that we're administering new experimental therapies that are sometimes patients only source of hope or source of treatment. Um, that are appropriate for them. So my, I guess my question, sort of question slash comment for the panel is um, thinking around including, you know, eligibility criteria in clinical studies. For, for those of you that see clinical protocols, we usually end up with a long laundry list of inclusion criteria and exclusion criteria. Um, we collect a lot of data points and do a lot of assessments throughout the clinical trial. As you might be aware, clinical protocols are becoming more and more complicated every year. We're looking for more and more data. We're asking patients to complete more and more assessments. And the burden of these, these studies is becoming more and more um, challenging for families to participate in and actually complete a study before dropping out. So my question really is around how do we better include any kind of pharmacogenomics um, markers or criteria in the eligibility space up front, or we're not overly weeding out some potential patients that might benefit from a treatment, but we're also selecting, you know, in a precision way, at least people that are uh, kind of narrowing the field a little bit. Um, is there a way to do this that's, that's not overly selecting, but sort of um, put some guardrails around um, eligibility that we can make sure we have the right kinds of patients? And I would say, Banaz or Reem, if you have an answer to that question. I, I think it is. Um, as, as you said, like we're mo moving towards precision medicine, and, uh, and the pharmacogenomics data is there, plays a major part in that. And then I, I've been saying this for, for some time, as we, you know, with, with advancement of scientific discoveries, uh, we are really truly, you know, walking towards uh, that field of precision and personalized medicine. And in a sense, the diseases that we have, we will become rare diseases. Like, you know, what, at one point, cancer was just one disease. Now, you know, it's a host of of uh, uh, hundreds of diseases, and so and and now with the profiling of, of you know cellular uh, um, uh, biomarkers or uh, uh, other uh, biomarkers in, in certain pathways and so on, 
we're we are going towards uh, selecting a narrow cohort of patients that that say a potential drug could work on those. So then, what do we do with that? <laughs> like you know, narrowing the, the the number of participants. How can we uh, come up with with models, uh, you know, clinical trial models that would allow, uh, say, a sh showing the significance of those uh, new drugs for those diseases? It's, uh, I don't have the answer. I think it it, it lies with 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 um, new uh, methodologies like you know the, the digital twins um, uh, and and some other uh, approaches that would allow uh, say investigating such drugs in a very narrow uh, cohort of, of patients. So that's my human being. <laughs> Thanks for that. And but not, do you have any thoughts, Scott, to that kind of answer? I know none of us really have an answer right now, but I think it's conversations like this that will bring that about. Scott, did you, mm -hmm. anything else there? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's really helpful. And I think, you know, we're moving in a new direction here where we're trying to leverage this unique personalized information to be able to move away from a more of a shotgun approach of drug therapy, right? We want something that is appropriate for the individual that potentially could work, or even in a lot of cases, appropriate for a combination of different drugs that might be more effective for a patient and also maybe have less adverse events for a patient. So I guess there's some obvious sort of disease types out there where we may have a known like biomarker or a known say mutation on a different tumor type. But there's a lot of other disease states where we're still in the early stages of really learning about them. And we may find that there's actually several different kind of subclasses. So I guess I'm sort of thinking out loud, how do we, how do we narrow things a little bit using genomic information that we have on hand? But at the same time, we may not have really, really precise targets yet. Um, we want to kind of narrow the field a little bit and, and, and have some kind of selection criteria. So I was just curious of the panel's thoughts if what they've seen in that space or, or anyone else, I guess, on the call here today that, that has seen us kind of moving in the right direction and, and taking some steps there. Yeah, Taya and Jennifer, I know. I yeah, I mean, I, I, I would add, I would add that recently I was working on a program, um, a small cell lung program. And we thought we had the marker identified. And, and when I was working on that, I said, you know, I don't know if anyone's worked with Tempest. Tempest is a, is a group that I really love. And I know that they've done great work in, in the field of oncology for, um, you know, biomarkers. And so I had suggested to them, let's go look at Tempest. Let's find the, you know, let's find the patients that are positive for this marker. And they really were like, you know, we actually think this drug is not only targeting this one marker. So I think that's going to be the challenge, is certainly with early development. So, you know, very often we just don't know yet. You know, we don't, we, we're not sure, and, and we wouldn't want to limit it. So I definitely think, you know, personalized medicine and all the work with CAR-T therapies, that's clear-cut. Um, and I also think, like, what we're getting at with the um, psychiatric medic medications, those are clear. You know, I know that. I have a couple... Uh, psychiatrist friends that, that utilize pharmacogenomics for everything they do. But I think in clinical development, it's, you know, depends on the stage you're at, right? Um, so sometimes we might think, yeah, I want to target this very unique subset of patients, but we don't know. You know, it could work on a broader group. So, you know, it's a, it's a moving target for sure, and it's definitely depending on every, you know, compound. So... It's interesting, but you have to remember that you know you, before you reach the stage of clinical development, you've already you know done a lot of research at the bench and in the cell, you know, gene expression, all of that, and and uh, animal studies to hone in onto that say potential compound. Or is going to move into the clinical phase of clinical development. Um, so these will be like you know uh, decision made and, and, and prior prime 
findings. It's not that, oh, we're, we're going to move into, you know, look at the pharmacogenomics and start studying <coughs> so patients. Well, how do you actually also uh, look at that, uh, uh, their genomic profile and decide that this, this cohort would be um, appropriate for the study? So all of that would be um, uh, sort of um, uh, decision made by prior um, findings um, to, to make that decision. And as you said, Scott, I think we are moving away from that, uh, like Lauren or uh, Shaw, to uh, working more in a smaller, smaller subset of, of patients if we want to continue to actually develop um, uh, drugs to treat diseases effectively. Um, and Yes, I'm in agreement with that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, Sophie, any any thoughts? I'm just listening and Questions learning, or? soaking up um, <laughs> everything that uh, Reem and um, <clears throat> Benaz are saying because this is somewhat new to me. The idea of you know personalized medicine and being able to um, tailor treatment modalities for each patient based on their genetic uh, composition is amazing. I feel like we probably still have a long way to go, but it's really encouraging. But I, I really want to give some time to um, the rest of our panel as well as our, our audience members to ask their questions. I think Donna, um, Vaishnavi, and Sunit have been waiting really patiently to voice their questions and maybe you can um, give them each a, a little time to ask and we can discuss those as well. Yeah, we can do that. So Donna, you want to go first and uh, if you can give us a quick question or thought, go for it. Hey, sure. Sophie, did we, did we disconnect? Oh, Michael. Michael? Can you hear us, I'm not Michael? Sure. But I can hear you, yeah, Donna. I can, now. I can hear you. Okay, so, okay, okay, not, so go ahead, Donna. I'm not quite sure question. what happened. We had a little glitch there. I hope everybody is able to still hear oh, us. Oh, okay, Michael, it's, it's just you. The rest of us can hear okay. each other. It's just you, Michael. Perfect, perfect. It's always just me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, we are into our okay. audience section where the audience can ask questions, and we're going to discuss those. So first is Donna. Great. Thank you so much. I just want to thank everyone for participating in this really important conversation. Um, I've already learned a lot more about pharmacogenetics. Um, I'm with an organization called Pathways to Trust and the Coalition Against Pediatric Pain. I'm essentially a rare disease mom, and I've been a patient advocate working in the space for 12 years. Because we work with kids who have high pain conditions and complex pain conditions, a lot of Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, complex regional pain, conditions that have historically been misunderstood, um, pharmacogenetics has made a huge difference in that population in terms of being able to manage care. Um, in my own family, my daughter, we we're a high sensitive and we're a rapid and an intermediate metabolizer. She kept ending up in the ICU when she was 10 years old after every surgery and they couldn't figure out why and PGX literally saved her life and made her safer now in hospitals when she has her surgeries. Um, about a year and a half ago was my first time taking my PGX card into a psychiatrist and obviously kids with medical conditions are also high users of psychiatric services. Um, and it was the first time that I had done that, and <laughs> the response was basically, this is pseudoscience. Why are you spending all your time online? I'm a little concerned about you, Mom. And the response that I got from this physician um, unfortunately led to my son being dosed improperly, and he developed serotonin syndrome. So it kind of set me on a mission to make sure that every patient that has any kind of condition knows about pharmacogenetics and how it can help make things safer. So my question to the group is this. It's a, it's a big uphill climb as a patient to try to get physicians who are not aware of pharmacogenetics um, involved. And when I saw the topic of this room, my first thought was, yeah, because if you have patients that have funky backgrounds with medications and adverse events, they're not going to want to take part in any clinical trials if you don't use pharmacogenetics. So my question is, as you're developing and moving forward, is there anything that this group could offer in terms of helping patients to better educate, in particular, you know, psychiatrists and psych um, moving forward, or just any advice, I guess, that I can share with that population. 
So Donna, I will say right now, it's, um, there's, <laughs> we're working on it, right? I think that there's a big learning curve here that we all have to accept and realize. Um, we have to have, start having conversations around PGX and, and things like that. Um, I don't know how many of you in the room know this, but I have a lot of damage from medication, three joint replacements, brain damage, I've lost my night vision. And on top of all of that, I don't react to opioids, so they don't work for my pain. I've had to learn how to compartmentalize my entire life because nothing helps. And so these things are, are so important, and yet we don't have a lot around the education and awareness. And Banaz is running a, a podcast, and there's a few of us here and there, right? You're telling your stories, but there's not a big focus on it. And I'm not sure. I think it needs more of a unified front, um, and we need to build a program where, educa where we're educating the physicians and the patients together. But I don't know. Anyone in this room want to fund that? That's why I wanted to know if that's <laughs> existed. You know, is there any place I should be referring people? Not yet. I think it's individual advocates, Donna, unless Banaz, I mean, I've just been telling people to listen to Banaz's podcast for just information. I've told my story. I've been talking to other advocates with their own individual story. But other than that, I'm not sure. Banaz, can you? Well, yeah, I don't think there is a right answer. All the answers you said were, were all options. Like, I, I do believe that education has to come back to schools before um, providers get out in the field, um, but that's a whole different story. But in the meantime, I mean, the only thing I can think of is really guiding them to maybe the FDA website where it does talk about that and some of the medication and the impact it may have on specific either disease state or again medication if it, that's relevant so that way it's more credible uh, website it really is out there and some of them again depending on the medication they might have that information about genetic testing they may not say it's pharmacogenomics in that word but if we understand pharmacogenomics is really looking at mainly um, pharmacokinetics and dynamics some of those information might be in the package insert of medications so maybe that's a good start, but I don't think we really have um, the answer at this point. Thank you so much, Benaz. As we were talking about before, we still have a long way to go. We're climbing up the hill, but we have not reached even close to the top to get all of this information. Thank you so much for steering us in the right direction. It looks like we have um, 10 minutes left, so I want to get to Vaishnavi and then Sumit to allow them to ask their questions. Uh, and then allow our panelists to respond to them. So Vaishnavi, you are next. <coughs> okay, Vaishnavi, if you can't unmute at this time, let's move on to Sunit. Sunit, if you have a question or a comment, you can add that now. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Sunit. I've been uh, doing clinical studies uh, for the past 12 years. Uh, I'm a medical physician by background and uh, been conducting uh, like clinical studies research in the hospitals in the greater Toronto area. So this is a great topic, precision medicine, personalized medicine, and uh, pharmacogenomics uh, is, uh, is the future of medication. medication. The thing is, um, there were discussions on how to include like uh, pharmacogenomics in clinical trials, and we, these trials are usually conducted for people you know, on a general level, so phase one, phase two, phase three, and then the post-market surveillance. So it's seen on what general population you know, has any side effects and stuff like that. So including patients in a certain um, like a clinical trials based on pharmacogenomics, we cannot generalize the effects of these, you know. Uh, so this is first comment. And second is we do not know the um, the, uh, these pharmacogenomic tests are not available for every single medication. They are just specific to some medication for certain conditions. So the in, in the true future of pharmacogenomics medication is like when we get results of these medications, we have to perform a test on the patient to see what kind of uh, profile it fits in. It's a spectrum, like from uh, a low metabolizer to high metabolizer, and then accordingly we adjust the dose 
to that patient. So this is very important that we need to have like a, um, a, a target for certain few medications we need to work on to get the test developed and then certain patients um, who, who like every person metabolizes medications differently. It's not like I can metabolize aspirin differently than the next patient who gets it. But we do not have no way of knowing, you know, how things work. So there's proteins and genes and uh, like uh, how they affect the person meta metabolism and the medications has to be done universally on all medications. And then it, all these tests will be done before we prescribe the medications to each patient. Uh, and then we can op get the optimal results. And uh, this is just in this two, three parts. Bananas, Reem, any thoughts there? Can I lose everybody? <laughs> Maybe I did lose everyone. I don't know. Oh, I'm still here. here. I was just like, you're fine. <laughs> Anyone have any thoughts? Or maybe you just totally stunned everyone, Sweet. <laughs> yeah, I think he stunned everyone. This is a, yeah, this is a, like a, a huge topic. And I do presentation all the time. I did presentation on personalized medicine previously. So, yeah, uh, personalized medicine is in its, in its infancy right now. But there are some uh, like uh, those, um, you know, anticoagulants and they have been developed, like we, we test them on people to test the profile. It's a, it would complicate the clinical studies, it would complicate the um, the profile and it would become very expensive. I don't know, insurance companies are going to pay for all this stuff. So I think currently we need to work on rare, rare diseases. Rare diseases would probably be an area to focus on because <clears throat> they are a small subset of populations where uh, we can uh, uh, introduce this and we do not have like to not have to test this on a mass population because whenever we do clinical studies it was for generalization the FDA approved that it is okay to be used in everyone so we will have to probably work on rare conditions or certain conditions which are uh, less prevalent I would say, yeah I, go ahead I would go ahead. say on that I think as we, as more and more people get tested, we'll build up and our, our database is going to grow with different medications, with different responses, things like that. I see um, Christine Ashcroft, who's with Invite, um, her, she said, to, she said once, and we did a broadcast together where she said she thinks of PGX as more of a seatbelt, right? And so you can take this test, you can know there are certain, we don't know everything, but we do know certain things. And all of the talk around these things reminded me, in junior college, and I'm a little off topic here, but in junior college, there was a course that I took on economics. And I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with Ford Motor Company and what happened there, but they had a car, the Pinto that was found that if it was hit from behind in a, at a certain angle, the occupants would die. And so they found out about this and they had a choice and it was either we recall all of these cars and fix it, which would be a huge gigantic cost, or we pay out for the dead people, which isn't gonna be as many and it won't cost us as much money. And so I think, I think of it, I think there's a moral obligation for us to look at as well. If we have technology, I'm dealing with damage from medications that we were trying out, medications were, that were standard of care, and there's no, you know, once you have damage, you can't fix that. So if there is a test that it would even basic certain compounds, we can protect someone that is now at $250 for a self-pay, how is that? How are we not even just offering it out there? That's a good question, Christine. I, I, I think I, I yeah, really appreciate. Ahead. Yeah, I really appreciate Sunit for bringing um, a little bit of balance to our conversation. Also, it's really important to look at all sides. And we still have a lot of questions, but a lot of potential with these treatments. So, I, I, I really appreciate that. And we're down to three minutes before the end of the hour, and we have one more. Um, audience member who wanted to speak, Ravid uh, Lazinski, wanted to make sure that 
they got a chance to ask a question. Can I say something really quick before we move on to Ravid? Um, when I, I really appreciate what Sunit was talking about because, you know, just recently we had a couple of million dollar treatments passed that were genetic cures for, for example, the SMA treatment for infants. And, you know, that puts the community in a situation where how do we get the funds for the babies to get this treatment? And right now, it, while we're focusing on these rare diseases, it is outside of the, you know, limitations that most parents have to provide these treatments. So, yeah, I really appreciate that. So I'll, I'll pass it now to Rafid. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I wanted to divert a little bit from this conversation and see what's your thought on a lot of, well, not a lot, but some of, mental, of the mental health conditions and in general in medicine today, we're seeing a lot of off-label use for any kind of therapeutics. And I have this with, for example, my mental health condition is treated with a blood pressure medication and I've seen now the weight loss medications are have or seems to have some effect of, of mental health conditions. So do you think PTX will be able to predict this? Will it change the clinical study design? Is it just a legislation thing? Um, how, how do you see that impacting the off-label use of medications. Anaz, you want to take that one? Um, well, that is a good question. I don't know, again, if I know 100% of the answer. Um, it really it comes down to the clinical trials that has to be done and what's on the package insert. I really don't know if, again, there's a really great answer for that, or maybe I'm fit to answer that question. I well, I had also say too, we have legislation passing, right? Um, we've been working for AB 425 here in California, and I think UCSF, I'm not sure if all of you are aware, but they just launched their own pharmacogenomics program within UCSF. So I think, and I think insurance companies, or some of them are starting to see the benefits. I'm not sure. And uh, I will say something provocative uh, in response to repeat, I repeat, um, is that we, you know, we are talking about precision medicine. We will probably will get into uh, predictive medicine and with collecting all the data, all the information that we get into one place and we have, we have chat GPT. <laughs> It's everything is data, and you learn, and you can learn, and you start coming up with all kind of ideas, and uh, that would take would impact also the course of of medicine, and even you know, research. I mean, we know that it's been utilized in now uh, a lot of AI is used in uh, upstream in, in making decision how to start you know, the clinical development or research and development and how to uh, uh, use or, or detect, uh, say, compounds to, to investigate and so on. And I think we are moving towards, you know, with that mass of data that is coming at us from all different um, um, areas will also impact uh, the, the medicine as well. You know, that use of off-label, yeah, it's working. The, the use of it is why people are using it is because it is working now. There's no explanation yet. Well, there will be explanation to why it's working. I mean, take Viagra. Um, <laughs> the <leg development>. <laughs> <laughs> for for <laughs> cardiovascular. We find other ways. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to say, I know we are at the time mark and we're on LinkedIn, so I don't want to take up everybody's timeline, but I want to thank my three guests for coming on and for everybody out there for listening. I saw some great faces. If you have questions, please feel free to throw it in the comments and we'll get back to you and answer those 
individually. And I know that Michael, who would close us out normally as having internet issues, Scott, Sophie, someone else want to want to take that close out for us? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Christine, I think, I think we're, yeah, I think we're doing fine here. Scott um, and Jen and Taya, do you have some closing comments that you'd like to make, please? Sure, I'll jump in and just, uh, again, thank our, um, thank our panel and, and Christine for hosting. Um, I think our one burning question, are we crazy to not include this? I think what we might be concluding here today is we're not crazy to conclude it, but we don't have all the answers quite yet and how exactly to include it, but we, we know we need to kind of be moving in that direction. So um, obviously not a one burning question with a yes, no answer, but something a little bit more complex and a little bit more forward thinking. And I, I, I'm excited that um, we've made progress and that we've made steps. And I think if we can continue to kind of have the voice of patients along with the voice of regulators and drug developers come together here, I think everybody wants to be developing smarter, more effective safer, cost-effective medicines, right? And I think I think PGX is one tool we can use to kind of make sure we're, we're tailoring things in the right direction. So super interesting conversation. We'd like to just thank everybody for being part of it and, and offering your stimulating thoughts today. Uh, yes, and this is Taya. I'm speaking on Sophie's account because we're in the same room together. Um, I would like to add to Scott's comments. Um, it it's definitely something that is important to, and has a value, but what that value is at this time, I, I feel like it's just in the infancy. And, you know, families can't afford a million-dollar treatment for SMA or the $3.5 million treatment for hemophilia. So we need to be thoughtful in how we're conducting this research so that it is an affordable option because – at the prices right now, it's really not even on the table, and insurance won't cover cover these costs. So uh, lots of things to think about, and I'll pass it back to you, Michael. Thank you. Thanks, Taya. Appreciate that. And, Sophie, I know you're going to take us um, out at the very end here, but before we do that, I wanted to make sure that the group knows that you have um, seven really super engaged co-moderators who are uh, involved in helping us put together the one burning question each month. I encourage you to engage with them on LinkedIn and each of you should have received uh, an invitation to join our LinkedIn uh, group and uh, you'll find that the archived discussions will be held there um, and housed there I should say and we will often um, add supportive materials that um, can help further the, uh, the investigation into each of these uh, one burning questions. And as usual, each month we um, you know, offer an open invitation to each of you to provide us with other topics that you think are, are, are going to be um, valuable. And the best place to do that is on our LinkedIn group. Um, and uh, hopefully each of you have received an invitation to do that. So thanks again to uh, my amazing co-moderators who work so hard um, each, literally each week uh, to put all this together. And Sophie, uh, masterful moderation today. And certainly, um, uh, Christine, thank you so much for, for pulling together um, this month's um, investigation into PGX. Um, I would agree um, th that uh, there are two patients involved here. One patients with the T that uh, we have to be thinking about, and the second, uh, the patients with the C that we need to have in order to get this to come to fruition. Um, it's definitely uh, a pathway forward to make sure that the right treatments get to the right patients, um, but uh, there's obviously a lot more work to go. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. And Sophie, if you wouldn't mind uh, closing us out here, that would be awesome. Fantastic, Michael. Thank you, everyone. In closing, again, I'm Sophie Yohannan. As we wrap, a couple of announcements. Uh, Paul Simmons from DBSA California wants to do an online workshop, or more than one, on this subject. So if you would like to join, he is going to share his email address in our summary post. That's psimmons at DBSA California. 
www.ghanaspeaks.com, and we will put that in the uh, summary post for you, and you can join for that online workshop. If you missed any of the conversation today or links and comments of our event post earlier this week, we would be posting a summary with a link to this audio discussion archived by Taya, who you heard speak earlier. And as well, if you would like to join our LinkedIn group where all discussions will be archived, please look out for the link in the summary post as well. Thank you everyone for joining. We really appreciate you and we look forward to seeing you on June 22nd. Bye-bye.